Is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah? OK, great. Um, over the last five years, I've been incredibly fortunate to um, have witnessed, and in some cases taken part in, some exciting advances in uh, the modeling of molecular structure. Um, blind predictions of protein structures that have reached near atomic accuracy. Uh, new ways to accelerate NMR and crystallographic structure inference using extremely limited data. And I think most impressive to me, the demonstration that new protein folds and even new enzyme active sites can be designed from scratch. Now, these accomplishments, which have taken place largely in the Rosetta community of molecular modelers, have been limited mainly to the protein world. But we should be able to do this for RNA. After all, there are beautiful algorithms, some of which are mentioned by Niles and others we'll hear about during the session, that will take an RNA sequence and quite accurately predict how it folds up or how it doubles back on itself to form these watson crick base pair regions. And these secondary structure models can be rapidly validated or refined through chemical footprint experiments. And these algorithms are good enough to design incredibly useful systems, as you've just heard. In terms of finishing the RNA structure prediction problem, there are still these leftover residues that I'm showing here as unpaired. But a renaissance in RNA crystallography over the last decade has confirmed that these residues are not just loopy and floating out in the breeze, but instead form well-ordered sacs of non-canonical, non watson crick base pairs, which are shown here in red, that act to form ordered junctions and tertiary contacts that position the helices, shown in gray, into precise three-dimensional structures. This RNA tertiary folding problem is quite complex, but there are some simplifications. First of all, these red regions, these, these so-called non-canonical motifs, involve just A, G, C, and U. We have a four-letter alphabet. And by now, we have a pretty good sense of how a G and a G, for example, like to base pair in a non-canonical fashion. Second, um, these motifs are now empirically known to often fold up in isolation into their functional structures, or at least sample those functional structures, or brought out of their large RNA context. And finally, probably the big simplification, is that these motifs are typically on the, in the range of 8 to 12 nucleotides long. And we should be able to solve an 8 to 12 piece jigsaw puzzle, right? In my talk today, I'm going to show you that we are on the cusp of having a deep and predictive understanding of RNA structure at atomic resolution, at least for these most basic RNA building blocks. And I'll argue that one of the main remaining barriers is actually a sociological one that I hope you can help me with at the end of the talk. I'm going to start the talk by showing how ideas underlying protein structure prediction can be transferred to the RNA world. And I'll show you some tantalizing early results um, related to atomic accuracy structure prediction. But then we're going to hit a crisis. Okay? And this is a, what's often called a conformational sampling bottleneck. And it has, I'm being instructed to stay here. Okay. Um, <laughs> stay, okay. Um, this conformational sampling bottleneck. Um, uh, has bedeviled the protein and RNA and protein DNA modeling fields for many years. Um, and uh, so the heart of my talk will be a new set of ideas, what we're calling a stepwise ansatz, that I'll propose resolves this conformational sampling bottleneck. And at the end of the talk, I'll show initial results um, in um, what we think are the most rigorous tests of a computational method, blind predictions. Okay, so let me show you where I started, the Rosetta strategy for protein structure prediction. If you give me a protein sequence of unknown structure and you ask me to predict a structure, the first thing I'll do is look through the database of existing protein structures and look for little pieces whose sequences and secondary structures match little pieces of your target sequence. And then these fragments are mixed and matched in a kind of Monte Carlo process guided by a coarse-grained energy function that tries to pair up beta strands and also bury nonpolar side chains, which I'm showing here as these gray blobs. The key advance that enabled atomic resolution structure prediction and design is a second stage of modeling, where we take hundreds of thousands of these models and then build in the side chains in atomic detail and then refine the positions of these atoms within the context of a physically realistic high-resolution force field that, opt that uh, rewards atom-atom packing interactions as well as hydrogen bonds in the structure. And then we take the lowest energy models and we use those as our predictions. Starting in 2007, I started to transfer these ideas to the RNA structure prediction problem. Now the fragments are largely drawn from the ribosome crystal structures. The fragments are assembled in order to optimize um, the number of canonical and non-canonical base pairs, as well as base stacks, at a coarse grain level. And then the refinement is guided by a modification of the Rosetta force field for proteins. It's basically a hack to make it work for nucleic acids. Um, a couple of years ago, my colleagues and I benchmarked this method, which we called fragment assembly of RNA with full atom refinement, or FARFAR. 
We tested this on 32 motifs, some of which you may know and love, some of which you may have solved crystallographically. Uh, these are two double-stranded RNA motifs that involve stacks of these non-canonical base pairs. They act as protein recognition sites throughout translation. This is a two-way junction that mediates a sharp kink between adjoining helices and riboswitches and other functional RNAs. And we also studied multi-stranded motifs like this hook turn motif. We were pleased to find that in many of these cases, far, far produced lowest energy conformations that recovered the non-canonical base pairing pattern seen in the crystal structures as shown here in these symbolic leontes westhoff annotations. In three dimensions, these models recovered the structures seen in my crystallography to armistice of two angstroms or better, tantalizingly close to atomic resolution. But you should be suspicious here. I'm just showing you four examples. I told you there were 32 motifs. In fact, 16 of the motifs were modeled at this level of accuracy, and 16 weren't. And I'd like to illustrate what went wrong with a kind of a quiz. So I hope you had your coffee during the coffee break. Um, here are two models. One of these is the crystal structure of a motif. I'll describe in a second. And the other one is the lowest energy far far model. And I'm going to ask you in a second to vote for which one is the right one. OK, what is the motif? It's a famous tertiary contact. On the left-hand side of both models is a tetra loop with the GAAA sequence and is ubiquitous in functional RNAs. And on the right-hand side is a receptor sequence that has evolved repeatedly in many RNAs to recognize and embrace the tetra loop. Okay, now, this is not a trick question. Um, who thinks the left-hand model is the crystal structure? Not a trick question. Please vote. Okay. And then who thinks the right-hand one, oh, who thinks the right-hand one is the crystal structure? Wow. Okay. This is, this is the worst performance I've ever seen at a conference. You should be ashamed of yourselves, ISCB. Actually, I was at the RNA Society conference about a month ago, and the majority got it right. But this is a... Um, you all thought it was a trick question, I think. Okay, what you're supposed to see, <laughs> you're supposed to see, is that this right-hand one is the de novo model, the far, far model. And what you're supposed to see is that it's less compact than the crystal structure. And there's a, you might be able to see there's a kind of a void in between where there really could have been nice interactions between the tetra loop and the receptor that would help the recognition of the two elements. Okay, but what you can, so at least some of us can see visually can also be recognized automatically by the Rosetta energy function. I'm showing here a plot of thousands of far, far models, um, and this is the energy in the y-axis. And you'll see that none of them reach nearly as low an energy as the crystallographic structure. Okay? This is the so-called sampling bottleneck. This is, uh, in other words, we, sort of, we know the rules of the game. We're supposed to create structures like this that are beautifully packed, compact, forming nice hydrogen bonds or base pairs. But we can't play it well. Our existing automated methods produce RNAs that don't look as good. They're not as well packed. Okay? And I want to point out that the sampling bottleneck is also the key problem, the key issue in all other high-resolution modeling applications I'm aware of, whether it's protein de novo structure prediction, protein-protein docking, protein DNA docking, you name it. So, in fact, on the first slide, I showed you an example of a blind structure prediction from the CAPS trials that achieved near-atomic accuracy. This only occurs in like one out of 100 targets. Most of the time, what we submit to CASP from Rosetta looks like spaghetti, okay? It's results like these for proteins and RNA that led me to rethink this problem when I started my lab a couple of years ago. It led me to really question the basic premises of the Rosetta approach. And I came up with a list of three issues, or if you will, fundamental flaws in the Rosetta strategy. The first one is, this has always bothered me, this reliance on the existing database of structures. I mean, what if you have an RNA actor and it involves three consecutive sets of torsion angles that are just never seen anywhere else in the database. You're screwed. You're never going to get the right answer to high resolution. Second, there's no guarantee that you're going to get a global minimum. The, the, the search is totally stochastic. This is Monte Carlo search. And a Rosetta job means basically involves kicking off 10,000 jobs and sitting back and praying that one computer here and another computer here give you low energy confirmations that are similar to each other. That is not guaranteed to happen. And most of the time, it doesn't happen in blind trials. Okay. And the third issue is something I've already alluded to. We would like to create these well-packed structures that have good energies with respect to this physically realistic all-atom force field. But this far, far algorithm and other, alg all other algorithms I'm, I'm aware of cannot efficiently search this high-resolution space. There are too many degrees of freedom. And if you move a couple angstroms by half an angstrom, the energy goes through the roof. It's an extremely rugged energy landscape that's difficult to search. So most algorithms have to transition through a coarse-grained or reduced representation 
nor does it carry out the global conformational sampling. And that is necessarily inaccurate. When my first student joined uh, my group, Prince Yipakivong, I told him, look, you came here to learn the Rosetta stuff, but I'm not going to teach you any of it. No fragment assembly, no full atom refinement. Let's think about this problem from scratch. And I gave him the simplest possible puzzle I could think of. Imagine you're on a desert island, okay? And I told you that at the end of RNA helices, you often find the sequence G, C, A, A. And we know from crystallography and NMR, we have to know that it forms a stereotype conformation. Okay, what is that conformation? Okay, and you're on an island, so you can't just check a database to, see, to figure out the answer. That would be too easy. Still, it seems like a pretty easy problem. There's four nucleotides, just a four residue loop. You should be able to enumerate all conformations, right? And it turns out to be impossible. For a single nucleotide, there are seven torsion angles, and you can just work it out. There's about a million conformations you'd have to enumerate to sample the problem at angstrom resolution. That's not too bad. I can um, create a million conformations and score them in about 10 to 15 minutes on, on this laptop. The problem becomes if there are four nucleotides, the problem is combinatoric. There are now 10 to the 24 conformations, and that would take trillions of CPU years to fully enumerate. So we thought of doing what we think of as the next best thing. Well, we can enumerate, but we can just enumerate one nucleotide. So let's do that. Let's start with this pink G. Out of those million conformations, most of them stick out into La La Land. But what we want, remember, the name of the game is to create well-packed, beautifully hydrogen-bonded structures. So we keep just a handful where the G comes back and packs against the helix. And for each of those models, we then enumerate the next nucleotide, okay? In this case, maybe this A. And then some of the conformations form nice hydrogen bonds and are nicely packed, and we keep those structures and everything within about 5 kT of the lowest energy structure we find, okay? something like a thermal ensemble. Then we move forward with each of those models and enumerate the next nucleotide, and then the next nucleotide, and we close the chain. I knew that we were on the right track when Perrin coded this up, and he found exactly the wrong answer, but it was wrong for a really interesting reason. Okay? Um, this is the experimental structure of that GCA tetra loop. And this is the structure that Perrin found. It's got one adenosine, reaches down into the helix and finds three really beautiful hydrogen bonds, completely non-intuitive, and packs against the helix. And the other residues form a nice compact structure on the top. So this is what we wanted, a well-packed structure. It just happens to be the wrong answer. Um, it turns out I had almost subconsciously given Perrin a code base where I had dialed down the torsional terms of the potential, which keep alpha, beta, gamma, etc., near their most favored values. And we turn, when we turn back on that potential, this is the lowest energy structure found, and it's within two angstroms of the experimental structure. Now, the aficionados in the audience may have uh, noticed another, maybe a cheat. Um, I chose to build the pink one and then the cyan one and the green, the orange. What if I chose pink, orange, green scion. I get a different set of structures by enforcing packing at each stage. And a priori, we don't know what the pathway is, and there are an exponential number of them, 2 to the n, where n is the number of residues. Um, but there's a trick, I'm not going to have time to go into detail, that some of you are familiar with from secondary structure prediction, dynamic programming or recursive style um, ordering of the calculation that lets us cover all possible pathways in polynomial time. And when we cover all those pathways, we still retain this structure, this accurate near native structure, as the lowest energy answer. Okay, what have we gained here? This calculation still takes a few hundred CPU hours. It's not trivial. When you could have gotten the answer but just by Googling GCAA RNA, uh, you, you, this experimental answer would just come right out. Okay, what we've gained, though, is we've, we've overcome the three fundamental flaws of the Rosetta approach, and we've done it in an ab initio manner. We haven't used any existing structures from the database. The calculation is fully enumerative and is guaranteed to give the global minimum uh, and if I repeat the calculation tomorrow, I'll get the same answer as I do today. It's deterministic as well. And finally, we've never at any point had to go through a stage where we coarse grain the potential between two bases or have to use a reduced or 2D representation. Those are the advantages, but there is still one disadvantage. Okay? We've had to make an assumption that the experimental confirmation can be reachable in the stepwise, residue-by-residue manner, and that is not guaranteed. It is a guess. It's a working hypothesis, or in physics speak, it would be called an ansatz. And the only way to check if the stepwise ansatz works is to try it on a bunch of problems. And that's what we're doing. Here's one of the test cases from the far, far benchmark, a double-stranded region from the signal recognition particle domain. We can sample over all possible nucleotide building paths. And this is the path that actually wins. That's the lowest energy. And here's the model. And it overlays quite well with the experimental structure within an angstrom. This is actually better accuracy than the far, far approach. And we can now start solving problems that were impossible for the previous approaches. So this one looks easy. This is an irregular loop from inside the ribosome. It's just six residues. And the problem is you cut it out, and you try to build it back. It's like a toy puzzle. 
It turns out to be hard because there are backbone configurations here that are extraordinarily rare. They're not seen elsewhere in the database. And a couple of these residues are bulged. And the other ones form non-canonical base pairs or base backbone hydrogen bonds. There's nothing canonical at all about this segment. But again, the stepwise ancestor produces one result, and that's shown in magenta, and it overlays within, again, an angstrom RMSD of the, of the crystallographic conformation. Let me just, as a final example, show you this quiz again, the tetra loop receptor. Now the stepwise onsats gives us ex much lower energy structures, and the lowest energy one is what I'm showing here. It again achieves sub-angstrom RMSD. We've just finished a benchmark of this onsats on 15 irregular loops, and what we find are that 10 are recovered at this level of near-atomic accuracy. And the other five are failures, but for interesting reasons. I showed you before that Farfar had a problem where it couldn't even reach low as low energies as the crystallographic states. But the stepwise onsats dig so deep, it discovers states that are lower in energy than the experimental conformation. It is exposing idiosyncrasies in our energy function, which I'll return to later at the end of the presentation. 10 out of 15 isn't that bad, and has given us the courage to seek out blind trials, rigorous tests of these ideas. This is the first one. It's a tetra loop receptor, not the classic one I showed you on the previous slide, but one evolved in vitro by Costa and Michel in one of my favorite papers from 1997. There's still no crystal structure of this alternative receptor. This is the stepwise ansatz model. It has a GA base pair in a geometry that at least I'd never seen before. And between them, there's a U. And this is weird because the U is not doing anything. Okay? It's bulged out into solution. It basically seems to act as a spacer nucleotide. We have tested this model through subsequent chemical mapping experiments. We find that the G and A are protected from chemical modification, and this U is unambiguously exposed and modifiable by CMCT. This is nucleotide resolution validation of the model, and we're now carrying out atomic resolution tests with the Pitch-Greeley lab through antibody-mediated crystallography. And I think the best part of the story, I don't have time for this, um, is a few months back, Tomas Herman um, at UCSD gave us in the RNA modeling community some puzzles, some crystal structures that he hadn't yet published yet. And this is his puzzle number one. It's a sequence from the 5' UTR of the human diamond delayed synthase uh, transcript. And his crystal formed what's likely a non-native dimer, okay? But he told us that it was a dimer. Okay, this is part of that of our model from the stepwise onset. This is mostly Watts Creek base pairs, these blue-green base pairs. But it contains some non-canonical features, like a CC, Watson Crick, uh, sugar edge base pair, as well as a bullish out U. And these, the, this model is in good agreement with the subsequent release crystal structure, again, achieving under an angstrom RMST. Now, there are some other really interesting stories related to these blind trials. Right now, um, Eric Westhoff and Neoclis Leontes, who are assessors of this experiment, as well as six labs that were involved, are writing up a paper that hopefully will come out by the end of the year. I do want to point out that, obviously, the RNA modeling community is bigger than six labs. I mean, I've heard at least four other talks at this conference already um, from, from of, of, of other methods. So. Uh, we're hoping to have more of these trials, hopefully regularly over the next year or two, um, and I invite everyone to participate. Okay, so let me just quickly summarize. Um, I started by importing ideas from protein structure prediction into the RNA structure prediction problem, and we saw tantalizing hints of atomic accuracy, but then we ran into the sampling bottleneck. And the key idea I'm presenting here is a new way to sample biopolymer structures that allows the enumeration of all residue by residue building paths of a, of a molecule, and it appears to achieve um, atomic accuracy in many test cases. And finally, we're entering this, I think, really exciting phase for our field where we can test our ideas at quite high resolution through blind trials on unreleased crystal structures. Let me end by pointing out what's next. I focused here on small motifs because I think those are the most base, basic building blocks. But of course, real RNA enzyme active sites have more than 12 residues. They have 15 or 20 residues. And real RNA enzymes in machines have hundreds or thousands of nucleotides. We have extensions of this onsatz that we think will work for those larger RNAs, but we have to still, we're still working on mustering the computational power to test those ideas. We do have a more immediate problem. We're seeing some issues with, with our energy function being inaccurate. It's likely due to the um, incomplete description of metal ions and a poor salvation model. And that's what we're currently mainly working on. My personal pet project is, um, is extensions beyond RNA. I mean, the stepwise onsatz was inspired by thinking about RNA puzzles, but the basic idea should work for any kind of biopolymer. And um, in recent work, I've benchmarked this idea um, extended for many proteins and loops, and it's nice. It, we appear to be achieving lower energies and more accurate structures than any prior approaches in Rosetta. And then finally, I think the really next big step, I emphasize this already, is a kind of sociological one where we as a community need more blind tests of these approaches. So if you 
or our colleague are solving, say, the structure of an RNA aptamer or hex loop by NMR or a crystallized part of a riboswitch, or even if it's like something that's already been crystallized before and you want more, get more, more attention to your structure, then just consider sending me or Eric Westhoff a, um, just the sequence. That's it. And you will get hundreds of eyeballs looking at the sequence and trying to model it. It will attract a lot of attention for basically what's something this is like a painless task for you. Just send us an email. Okay. So let me finish by um, thanking my colleagues in this work. For instance, Pakivang was a graduate student who helped me develop the stepwise ansatz and carried out much of the computational coding. And Clad Wang carried out the chemical mapping experiments. Tomas, Neocles, Eric, and the RNA model community have helped set up these first rounds of blind trials. David Baker and the Rosetta community um, have helped me a lot by sharing insights as well as code, base, code snippets. These are the sources of funding. Um, I do want to thank the organizers for the kind invitation to come here. And thank you for your attention.